Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back to the Lit Student Conference. We hope you had a good lunch break and are ready to start the afternoon session on information and networks. So we're excited to open this session with a talk uh, by our plenary speaker, Professor Adam Weirman. Professor Weirman is with the Department of Computing and Mathematical Sciences, or CMS, at Caltech. He received his PhD, master's, and bachelor's in computer science, all from Carnegie Mellon University, and has been a faculty at Caltech since 2007. Professor Weirman's research strives to make the network systems that govern our world sustainable and resilient. He is best known for his work spearheading the design of algorithms for sustainable data centers and a, a recipient of multiple the ACM Rising Star Award, ACM Symmetric Test of Time Award, and the IEEE Communication Society multiple teaching awards, and has co authored many best papers at a wide variety of conferences across computer science, power engineering, and operations research. Um, and now, just a note if you have any questions during the presentation, Professor Weirman said he's happy to take questions during the talk. So you can type your questions in the chat or raise your hand with the reactions feature, and we can call on you. Um, and with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Weirman with his plenary talk on online optimization and control using black box predictions. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here virtually. I had really you know, hoped when the invitation came that I'd be uh, there in person, uh, but this is a lot of fun too, and it's nice to see so many familiar faces uh, in the, uh, you know, audience here. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen many of you in person. Hopefully we can fix that soon. Um, so today, I, this, this talk is actually some new work that I haven't presented very much. Uh, so this is one of those talks where, you know, although it's a plenary, I really hope uh, that I get follow up and questions and, and poked and prodded because, uh, you know, this is something that we're really excited about uh, in terms of a new direction and, you know, would love to get feedback on uh, either, you know, in the discussion today or following up afterwards. Um, so the I'd say the main collaborators uh, for the most of the results I'll talk are, are listed here uh, to students uh, at Caltech and some collaborators at Georgia Tech as well. Um, yeah, so I'll jump in. So the 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 motivation for this work is really something that you know we've seen many many talks, uh, starting with the sort of uh, statement about the optimism of using AI and ML tools in smart X, smart cities, smart grid, smart transportation, you know, whatever it is, these societal scale network systems. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a lot of reasons for this broad excitement. Uh, and, you know, many of us are really working to, to make these tools uh, amenable to, to these systems. But, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, the deployment of these uh, tools in these applications is often, you know, uh, I guess has a history of embarrassing failures as much as successes. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sure many of you have seen this slide uh, multiple times, but this is my favorite, uh, you know, very visceral visual example of the failure of these tools where, you know, you take a stop sign, you add tape in some strategic locations, and it looks like a speed limit sign to the to the vision recognition tool. Uh, and, is, oh, everyone, uh, we, I don't think slides, we're seeing the presented slides. Right? Oh, you're not seeing the presented slides? Okay, let me uh, fix that then. Thank you. Um, Okay, now let me. Uh, there, now are you seeing my uh, slides move at this point? Um, I think it might be loading. It says you've started screen sharing, double click to enter full screen mode. Okay, something's going on. Uh, Okay, um, let me stop. Of course, Zoom decided to update right before. I think it's working now. But you're muted. Now I'm fixed. Okay, good. It's changing as I click through now. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. As I, I Zoom updated right beforehand, so I'll, I'll blame them. Um, okay. 
Okay, so here's where we are. So this this is my uh, this is what I was saying is the slide that everybody's always seen is you know one of the most famous embarrassing failures of these vision tools where you add uh, you know tape in a few strategically placed locations and you know a stop sign looks like a speed limit sign uh, and you know chaos ensues. Uh, but, you know, this is one of many. There's a huge variety in lots of these uh, societal, you know, infrastructure systems where, uh, you know, AI tools, the failure modes of them and uh, show up in unexpected ways and can have, uh, you know, bad results. Um, and, you know, this, not to dwell on those, but I think, you know, many of us are in this area right now and lids, you know, of course, it's one of the leaders in this area where, you know, the goal of, of us as researchers then is to truly understand, can the guarantees required by these safety critical applications be enforced uh, using these AI ML tools? And it's not clear that the answer to this is yes. I mean, uh, some people in, in my department here would argue that the answer to this is no, and we really need to be cautious uh, with these. But I think, you know, we can certainly do better than we're doing. And, you know, in caricature form, uh, I'd say, you know, I, I like these sort of cartoon views, you know, there's a sense in which you know, the, the black box, you know, AI ML tools can provide good performance most of the time, uh, but fail to provide the robustness and safety guarantees, whereas sort of more traditional classical control online algorithms can provide robustness and safety, but give up some performance gap compared to what we can do, hopefully, with these AI tools. And, you know, the question on the previous slide in picture form is basically one of can we expand the policy space so that you can, you know, nearly match the performance of the black box AI ML tools uh, while still having these robustness and safety guarantees. Um, and, you know, for, for me, I like to sort of be application driven. And so to make that kind of question really concrete in one of the applications where, where we're spending a lot of time, uh, I like to think about, you know, carbon first data centers, data centers that are designed to minimize carbon usage. And so we have a large center on this uh, uh, where you know we're partnering with a number of companies and Anna's group at uh, Google has really uh, done a lot of this work uh, with Google. Uh, and the, the high level story, this is her uh, figure, her group's figure, is to say, you know, can we do work in data centers in a way that we're you know, doing more work when the wind is blowing and the sun is uh, uh, shining uh, to be able to reduce the carbon footprint of our compute loads, our, our you know, data center workloads. Um, but of course, doing this, uh, there are many ways, and, and there have been a lot of papers about doing this with you know, AI, ML tools, black box tools, those things cannot be deployed at an industry scale because these are safety critical systems where guarantees are crucial. Uh, if something fails, if your, your predictions are off and you're not able to serve load, this is a disaster that leads to massive headlines, massive revenue loss, right? This is not something that we can play games with. Uh, and so it's really crucial to somehow find a way of getting the benefit of these uh, you know, AI tools without uh, giving up the guarantees that are there in the systems today. Uh, and so, you know, this this question, this uh, you know, this uh, field is growing at the interface of uh, you know control and learning. Uh, if you're not yet aware of it, you know, the L4DC is a really high quality conference that's emerging in these areas. There's a number of you know weekly online virtual talks, uh, you know, that are you know providing interesting uh, insight into this community. Many workshops at all the various MAP uh, centers around the U.S. and Europe uh, in the last few years. So it's there's a lot of resources out there if you want to get. Uh, embedded uh, into these sorts of questions, and and from these you know fields, it's, it's it's really been growing quick. There's there's a increasing set of papers that basically uh, look to you know take your favorite AI ML tool uh, and add guarantees to it, uh, and you know there's some really interesting techniques that are derived uh, you know to do this. You know model based RL, the open based policy learning. You know I could make this list multiple slides uh, if I wanted and go into a lot of detail on each one. Our group has been doing some work in, you know in each of these, which is probably why I focused on on these four, um, but uh, many others as well, including lots of people uh, in LIDs have been working in these directions. Um, but you know to post poke fun at us a little bit, I sort of, uh, you know, there's a sense in which there's a little bit of a Mad Libs uh, for papers going on uh, in, in this community right now, where if you pick a guarantee that you want to add and your favorite AML tool and an application, you have a paper title. Uh, and so you can do, you know, stability constrained RL for voltage control, certifies deep RL for traffic management, you know, and so on. And, and you can have a really nice research agenda just by filling in these blanks, uh, you know, and, and writing the paper that follows it. 
Um, and, you know, to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm poking fun at myself, this first one is one of ours. So, you know, we're, we're definitely uh, center in this, uh, in this field. Um, but that's kind of, I, I want to go a different direction with this talk, because, you know, the, this interface has been around for long enough now that we're starting to get a sense for what kind of more universal approaches and techniques uh, might be possible here that are, are not sort of, uh, you know, AI model dependent or guarantee dependent and, and what we can do beyond that to take a step up. Uh, and so I, I want to talk about one approach that's emerging that has that as its goal. Uh, and I'll give you kind of an overview in today's talk of that approach, some progress and some open questions there. Um, it's not to say it's the only way that, that one can go about kind of leveling up from, you know, an individual model and policy, uh, but I think it's a promising one. So, so that's, that's what we'll focus on. And in cartoon form, uh, basically, the high level of this approach is to take a little bit of a k-experts perspective on this problem where you know you imagine that the black box ai ml tool that you're trying to you know match or or kind of take advantage of is an untrusted expert it has some advice but you don't know how much faith to put in it whereas the you know control policies uh that we know and love and have studied for a long time these are trusted experts you know what guarantees you're getting from them you know what they'll what they'll work and the question is can you divine design a way to combine the advice from untrusted experts with the advice from trusted experts in order to find that sweet spot in the middle so that's the high level view uh, of this approach. And you know, what do I mean by defining that sweet spot in the middle? I mean, aiming for a bi-competitive guarantee. So uh, bi-competitive meaning you're trying to do well compared to both of those algorithms. And so for the untrusted advice, you wanna be what's kind of called in the literature consistent. You wanna nearly match the performance of the untrusted experts. Uh, and this is only relevant in the case when they do well, but of course, in their, when they're bad, you're doing it as well. So you want to guarantee like the cost of your algorithm is, you know, one plus delta times the cost of the untrusted expert. And that means when the untrusted expert is good, you're also very good. You're not giving up much. Uh, but at the same time, you want to match the guarantee that the trusted expert is providing. And so you want a guarantee that is nearly what the trusted expert is providing. So one common form of that is that, you know, you have this competitive ratio guarantee between you and the optimal and your factor, your, your approximation loss uh, is nearly the same as what the trusted expert was getting. So again, you're not giving up too much compared to what the trusted expert was able to achieve in terms of its guarantee, but because of the bi-competitiveness, you're also uh, matching what the untrusted expert is able to do. Uh, and, you know, to give you a, a sense of the trade off between these things, you know, a classical approach, one can think of, you know, model predictive control, uh, you know, this is a way of combining taking predictions and making a decision. Uh, and, you know, if your predictions that you're using in MPC are really good, then you're near optimal. And so you're consistent. Uh, but if your predictions are bad, you know, classical forms of MPC can be really bad. And so you're not providing robustness. And so the, the language here is basically to find a way of doing both. Uh, and so you need to kind of follow the predictions when they're good, but hedge enough that you're not led down the wrong path by the predictions uh, that you're given from the algorithm. So that's the framework. And this is this sort of uh, framework of online decision making with untrusted advice is kind of emerged in the last three years or so, uh, starting with some work, I don't know if Vasilis is in the audience, but some work by him and a collaborator. Uh, and you know, it emerged first in online caching, and in the last three years, there's a wide variety of online uh, algorithms questions where this kind of framework has begun to be studied. Oftentimes, you know, these are at the state where, you know, there is an algorithm known that can provide some robustness and consistency guarantee, but the questions of what the optimal guarantees are and how close you are to that are still open in, in many of these cases. And a few of these, you know, more precise results are starting to get narrowed down, but, but not in many yet. Uh, and so it's really an open kind of wild west sort of area at this point. Uh, and so our group has been mainly focused on these uh, ones on the right. Oh, oh, there's a few results on things on the left as well. Um, and so that's what I'll, I'll focus on today. So my goal today is, is not to, you know, really delve completely into the full detail of any particular application, but to use, uh, I had hoped three, but from time constraints, just two uh, applications to uh, illustrate 
how algorithm design works in this uh, bi-competitive robustness versus consistency framework, and to show kind of how you go about understanding fundamental limits of different approaches to algorithm design in this uh, kind of approach for combining black box IA with uh, traditional guarantees. And so we'll look at two in depth, uh, convex body chasing and online optimization with switching costs. These are really, you know, I'd say very well studied uh, problems in this domain that have received a lot of attention uh, in the last few years. Uh, I'd hope to talk about LQR uh, as well, but uh, I'll, basically just mention it on a few slides and give you pointers to a paper. I think that's all I can have time to do. Um, so uh, with that, I'll take a little bit of pause in case there are questions just about the idea of robustness and consistency. Uh, and then we'll go into like details uh, about uh, these two applications. Anybody wanna chime in? I'm not seeing the chat, so if there's... Uh, yeah, feel, please feel free to just unmute and ask a question. Quick question. Um, just what's your definition of an online algorithm? Like you're grouping it along with control algorithms? Uh, yeah, good question. So, so really, you can apply this framework to anything that you're making a decision uh, online. So you have information up to some point and not information about the complete future. So the places where it's been applied so far are usually whatever information you have uh, about the future is an uh, untrusted prediction. Uh, and so that goes into this notion of consistency. You don't know how much to trust it. It's coming from some black box tool. Uh, it might be really good or it might be way off. And it's you, know, you don't have a model to tell you what that information, uh, how the quality of that information. And a key thing is really you're not assuming model or bounded information on the errors from that untrusted advice. It's really you know, arbitrarily bad. Potentially. Okay, uh, now I'll keep going. It'll, uh, uh, the, the first example will also help to make a lot of uh, this very concrete. So, so our first example is convex body chasing. Uh, and so in case you haven't seen it, I'll do a little uh, walk through cartoon of what the problem is. So it's an online problem where at any given point, you're choosing a point in some space, think a high dimensional space, but I'm drawing 2D. Uh, and then you're presented a body uh, in each round. In each round, you have to move to a point in that convex body. Uh, and then the cost is your distance, uh, the distance that you move to that new action, that new point. Uh, and then, you know, this repeats, you get a new body, you take the movement, uh, you pay your cost, and so on. And so then your total cost uh, in the instance is the movement, some of the movement costs, uh, you know, that you made at each round, uh, and you're constrained to always be in the body. And so the, the challenge of this is you don't know future bodies. Uh, and so the question is, you know, how do you decide where to move in the body, right? In this case, if you had known everything a priori, you could have moved to, you know, this point in the intersection and never moved again. And that would have been way better than, you know, the choices that I uh, drew on the screen, but you can't know the future bodies. So how do you know to do that or not? And, you know, this is a problem with a long history. Uh, so it's, uh, very useful, uh, we found in recent years in safety and stable stability for control. So uh, I won't go into depth here, but you can use this as a tool in uh, learning your model online. So if you wanna do control where you don't know uh, the dynamical system ahead of time, you can use the convex bodies to quantify the set of uh, uh, sort of models that are consistent with uh, what you've seen in the data and then have that body shrink in a nested way uh, uh, as you learn more about the model and so you can, as, you, as you learn more about the model and so you can use that to then do uh, sort of uh, learning uh, you know stabilization stabilizing control within an unknown uh, system uh, which is very nice um, and so there's there's a number of other places where you can use it in the control context as well. Uh, and then on the algorithmic side, there's been a lot of progress in recent years with some really exciting results by Sebastian Bubak and, and Mark Selke uh, and, and, uh, uh, and Anupam Gupta as well, uh, his group. And the I'd say the, the state of the art here is that, you know, the intuition, the simplest algorithm that does near optimally is basically what you should do if you don't know anything about the future is move to the Steiner point, some notion of the center of each body. 
And if you do that, you get a uh, competitive ratio that is uh, order D, but you know, if you think of T as you know, log T is not such a big factor, root D. Uh, and so this is nearly optimal because you can show a lower bounds that uh, no, no competitive algorithm or no online algorithm can be better than root D competitive. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the, the situation here. There's an important special case, which is the nested case where the bodies are always shrinking. Um, but you know, this is for the general uh, scenario. Uh, and you know, what you get from this is you see that the algorithms that do well in the competitive case are very conservative. They're always moving to the center of the body. Uh, and that's an indication that you know, advice can really help. So going back to that same example from before, if we had advice from some AI tool, uh, that guided us to the, you know, that intersection, we could move there uh, and do way better uh, than we did in our moving to the centroids of the bodies. Uh, but of course, if the advice had been bad, we could also do way worse. Uh, and so this is exactly the motivation for the robustness versus consistency framework. We want to, you know, do well if the advice is good, but not be messed up by the advice if the advice is off for whatever reason, like in the stop sign example. Uh, and so one way to frame this in a, you know, in a very specific way is you could imagine a black box that always follows either the trusted or the untrusted advice and just switches between them. Uh, and this is you know, one simple framework for uh, designing algorithms in this robustness versus consistency world uh, that's been pretty successful in a lot of places. Um, so it, it's a good starting point for thinking about how to design the algorithms. Uh, but of course, you should keep in the back of your mind, you know, it's, it may not be enough to follow them. You might need to combine them in some way to, to figure out something else to do. Uh, but you know, I'd say a big bulk of the work has been uh, in this community so far has been on these switching algorithms. Uh, where you imagine you have these two com components of advice and you want to choose one to follow each round and when to switch between them. And so we'll start there with our first attempt at kind of understanding algorithms for this problem. Uh, and you know, this gives you a flavor for what they look like. So, so the way a switching algorithm tends to work is that you start by following the untrusted advice, because if you don't follow it, you could be way off by, you know, you could already give up a lot uh, compared to the optimal by following the conservative trusted advice. So you need to start by following it. Uh, and then you follow it for a while until some condition is met. And the smarts in these algorithms is figuring out what that condition is. Uh, and then you switch to the trusted advice until again, some condition is met and the smarts in the algorithm is figuring out what that condition is uh, and then rinse and repeat. And so for, for this algorithm that we're, we're proposing here, it's kind of a doubling algorithm where you follow each algorithm until it uses a particular cost R. Think of that as a parameter that you can set optimally if you wanna you know, play with things uh, and then double it so that you're never following any algorithm for too long. If the algorithm is really good, then incurring cost R is gonna take a really long time and that's good for you. If the algorithm is bad, incurring uh, cost R will take a very short amount of time or if the advice is bad, it'll take a short amount of time and then you'll you know, quickly switch to the trusted advice. Uh, and so it kind of inherently gives the balance that you'd hope for uh, between when to use these without putting any assumption about how good the advice is or how bad the advice is or learning anything about the quality of the advice. Um, so this is a simple thing. Uh, and so, you know, to highlight two things, it treats, it, ta it takes no, uh, you know, it takes no information about how the different advice points are coming. I don't care what those algorithms are at all in writing an algorithm like this. And you can bias yourself towards either consistency or robustness by basically choosing the lengths of time, uh, the cost you're going to incur in each of these phases. And so if you have more confidence in your uh, sort of untrusted device, you can implement that by changing that sort of the threshold. So it's very general in that way. And, and the type of result you prove then is something like the following, where you know for, we'll start with the nested case. This is where the bodies are always shrinking. Um, so here, this switching algorithm gets you know one plus delta consistent. Uh, and uh, D over delta robust. Uh, and so notice that you know, the optimal, the best known state of the art competitive ratio was order D. Uh, and so this is getting you know, up to a constant factor of the best competitive ratio possible while giving up you know, only an additive constant factor. And there's a trade-off you know, that is you know, likely the best you could hope for here, like delta versus one over delta between the two things. And that delta can be chosen by, by setting R in this algorithm. 
And so this is this is the type of uh, result you can get in this area. And so this then, you know, to, to sort of summarize, it takes an arbitrary, you know, black box AI tool and can do just as well as it up to a delta factor while maintaining an order an order optimal competitive bound uh, without caring about how either of those work. And so it's a best of both worlds type result. Uh, so yeah, the green is basically what I said. So you're getting a black box AI imbued with uh, a robustness guarantee uh, with a very simple combination of the two. But you know, this so far was just the nested case. And so it's gonna get more interesting. Uh, and this is where the type of algorithm, how you do the combination, we're starting to understand the limits of uh, different approaches. Uh, and so here there's a, in this body chasing world, there's a fundamental limit on what you can do in the general case with switching algorithms. Uh, and so I won't go into how you prove this lower bound. It's, it's a somewhat complicated uh, construction, but you can show that you know, any switching algorithm, no matter how it decides to switch whatever that threshold is between them, uh, can't be better than three consistent uh, if it maintains a competitive ratio that's you know, constant or that's kind of bounded in the, in the dimension in this way. And so if you want to have a, a robustness guarantee, you can't be within, you can't guarantee you're within a factor of three of what the AI black box could do if it was doing well. And so this highlights that, you, you know, there's a necessary performance loss if you want to add on uh, the sort of guarantees, the performance guarantees that you would, you're getting from the trusted advice. Um, and, you know, but for the case of switching algorithms. And so this motivates, you know, the question of can we do better than uh, switching algorithms? Are there, are there other algorithms with better guarantees? And there are. Uh, so the, you can, one that we've been able to show up so far uh, is to kind of frame this a little differently. So you don't want to just follow, you want to interpolate between, between the points. Uh, that are coming from the advice. So remember X, you know, one hat here is the untrusted advice and uh, X one is the trusted advice. Uh, and so you want to, in some sense, interpolate. And the, and the way you want to interpolate is, oops, is adaptive uh, where we actually can show a reduction between the you know, goal of providing robustness and consistency with a new problem, which is just by competitive line chasing, where you want to be basically always be on the line rather than always be in the body. And you want to be always on the line where you're competitive with the cost of any endpoint of the line. Uh, and so this is a you know, very concrete, seemingly simpler problem uh, that one can go after. And you can be competitive in this line chasing, by competitive in this line chasing problem uh, with an algorithm that basically, if the uh, advice is bad enough over a long enough horizon, uh, you just follow the algorithm. Otherwise, you follow the advice and take a greedy step towards the uh, you know, control algorithm, the trusted advice. Uh, and that greedy step, the size depends on the relative costs of the algorithm and the advice and adaptively changes based on the running cost of those. So when I write cost here, I, I should have put a like subscript T. This is the running cost up to your current decision point uh, in each of these algorithm statements. And so you're kind of adaptively, adaptively understanding how big of a greedy step to take from your advice uh, to the Steiner point uh, of these bodies. Okay, and yeah, the key there is that it's adaptive. And with that kind of interpolation algorithm, you break through the three consistency boundary. You still can't get all the way to one in this case, uh, but you can get to root two plus delta. Uh, and you know, interestingly, the, the dependency between consistency and robustness is a little worse. You get a delta squared dependency instead of just a delta dependency. Um, and so, you know, in this case, uh, adding robustness really does lead to sacrificing the performance uh, of the black box AI a little bit. We don't know yet what the fundamental limit here is, whether this root two is necessary. I would, I would conjecture that it, it's actually probably the right, uh, you know, constant factor and there's probably a lower bounds that will, will match it. Um, but that's a, you know, conjecture, probably a weak conjecture, not a strong conjecture. Um, uh, but it would be very interesting to understand that. Okay, so that's that's what I wanted to say about that. And so in the body chasing world, I, I basically chose that example application to highlight this 
contrast between switching algorithms, which are kind of the entry point to this field and have gotten a lot of the attention, to uh, more complex algorithms that don't just switch between uh, the choices that the algorithms. And it, so it's not always enough uh, to follow one or the other. The other part of the algorithm design that I want to focus on today is memory. So everything that I've talked about has required this memory of costs and actions over the entire history to make these adaptive choices. Uh, and so there's a natural question of whether that kind of memory usage is needed uh, in these algorithms. Is that something that's essential? Do you really have to be looking back in time uh, to be able to get this balance between robustness and consistency, or is that just a function of the algorithms that we've studied so far? Uh, and so that's that's what I want to look at next, and we'll look at that in the context of a different application, this, this online optimization with switching costs. And so here, the problem is very much like body chasing, uh, but now instead of always being in a body, you're always trying to optimize it per round uh, cost function. And so at each round, you get a cost function, you choose your action, you pay the cost uh, there, and then like in body chasing, you pay the switching cost, the movement cost as well. And so the difference is that now you, the, you know, it's not equally it's not equally free to be anywhere in the body you pay uh, a cost function to be in there and of course if this you know cost function has a you know discontinuity at the end you can recover uh, convex body chasing from this problem and so you know each round you're getting these costs you make a decision you pay a switching cost and so on and so just like uh, in you know body chasing the, the your total cost is the sum of the per round costs and the question is you don't know future cost functions where do you go? Uh, in this case, this movement to X2, to the minimizer out here didn't really help you. You should have just stayed where you are and avoided incurring that movement cost to go there and back uh, because the third cost function had a minimizer very close to the first one. And so without knowing the future, you made that mistake and incurred extra cost. Okay, so like body chasing, this is a you know area with a huge literature at this point. Uh, lots of applications and data sensors, which which is why I started working on it. But also video streaming, we've had deployments, uh, you know, in in true protocols uh, come out of this work. EV charging startups have been out there. Camera tracking has been used in uh, NBA uh, video tracking uh, games at this point, and many other applications. So it's it's been a very impactful uh, theoretical literature, uh, and there's been a ton of progress over the last decade. Uh, and kind of the state of the art here uh, is that, you know, for at least in, in one general class of cost functions, if the cost functions are alpha polyhedral, uh, then you can really understand uh, what the competitive ratios are. So if the cost functions are convex, you get this root over one, put one or root of one over alpha, uh, where that's alpha is the polyhedral. And the key thing for, for this point of the talk is you can achieve that without using memory. You can achieve that without paying any attention to historical cost functions or historical actions, just making a decision based on the current round information. Uh, and even in the non-convex case, the best known algorithms are memoryless uh, as well. And so memory is not needed in the robustness uh, alone task for these problems. And so the question is, do you need it for you know, combining robustness and consistency? And then also I'll emphasize you know, that just like in the body chasing, these things are quite conservative. So especially in the non-convex case, the best known algorithm is a simple like move to the minimizer uh, algorithm. Uh, and you know that's really conservative, right? It's saying, I want to optimize the current round without taking any ideas about what future costs are going to do. Uh, and of course, if you had information about future costs, you could do much better. Uh, and so advice can help. And you know, just like in the body chasing, it's easy to see this. You know, I already shed, said if you know you knew to go to that kind of middle ground and never move from there right away, you would save a lot of switching cost and not pay much in terms of your hitting cost on any of the rounds. Uh, and so advice could help a lot. Uh, but if the advice was bad, you know, you could be moving a lot and not paying a benefit in the cost functions and, and it could be really a disaster. And so uh, just like in the body chasing world, you want to take advantage of these predictors, but if error in the predictors can really hurt you. And so it's really important to find ways of getting the best of those predictions while also incorporating the guarantees from traditional algorithms. And so just like in the body chasing, we'll start with a switching algorithm here for, for simplicity. And you know, it's it's an algorithm very much along the lines of the form of the previous one, except the condition for when you switch is actually much more 
complicated to figure out how to do accurately. So I can't write it down as simply, and I don't want to emphasize it too much. So I'll just state the result here. Uh, and you know, the key thing here is you can see a contrast between uh, the form of this and the form in the body chasing. This is a much harder problem, uh, at least in terms of the guarantee you can achieve. There's a this sort of uh, exponential dependency between the consistency guarantee and the robustness guarantee. Uh, and this is not just a function of our analysis. Uh, this is uh, a necessary exponential trade-off for any online algorithm uh, in this context. Uh, and so this is a context where in terms of an order sense, there's not a win from uh, the uh, non-switching algorithms. And, and I'll emphasize that that's a function of the fact that this, this theorem is for non-convex optimization. Uh, if you had convex optimization, there is now a win uh, to going to non-switching algorithms and taking advantage of the convexity of the functions to inter interpolate in some ways. And so we have a, an ongoing paper that is going to uh, highlight that in a result. Um, but I think that you know the this is a good place to really emphasize the power of this because this you know this is uh, now oh I'm sorry let me emphasize one other thing and so the this exponential uh, trade-off one thing that's uh, I think it really highlights is choosing the guarantee you want matters a lot, right? So there, there's a parameter in the algorithm uh, that lets you kind of fix how much you want to bias towards consistency versus robustness, uh, which you can think of as a confidence parameter in how good you think the predictions are going to be. Uh, and you really pay a cost in robustness uh, for, uh, for putting faith in your uh, predictions and trying to aim for a you know one plus delta type guarantee. Uh, and so there's, you know, very often a, an important question on top of a result like this, which is how do you adaptively choose that parameter that kind of codifies the confidence you have in the advice? And you know that I'll, I can emphasize the importance of that uh, with the example and also demonstrate how useful this is in practical uh, settings with an example. And so I'll, I'll return back to that kind of uh, sustainable carbon-free data center design question where the goal is to use predictions of solar and wind and workloads in order to make decisions about how to you know, allocate jobs and how to turn on and off servers and all that sort of thing internally to your data center. Uh, and you know, here we'll use this algorithm and we'll combine you know, a black box kind of neural net approach uh, that you know, many companies have been uh, playing with for doing these predictions with a trusted robustness guarantee for your uh, online algorithm. And you know, this is the uh, sort of results you get. So here, what we did is uh, to make these plots, the, the left one is uh, a plot where there's noise added after the training of the AI. And the right plot is one where there's a distribution shift after the training of the AI. And so the idea here is, you know, you have your AI tool and then something went wrong. Either you didn't train it enough and so there's extra noise that kind of leads the model to be bad or maybe the distribution that you're modeling shifted since you trained and, and that leads to problems. Uh, and so what these show then is the, the top dotted line is the performance of the, you know, AI tool, the neural net based uh, approach where, you know, if there's no, if everything was accurate in training, it does really well. But if there's a distribution shift or you know problem in the training, it can do bad. And you know again here, if there's distribution shift, it does bad. But if everything went perfectly, it's really good. Uh, and then the top, this sort of long dashed line is the trusted algorithm where it doesn't use the predictions, so its performance is independent of this error in the training uh, versus the deployment. Uh, and then the various green lines are starting from very uh, unconfident in the predictions, or sorry, very confident in the predictions and going to very unconfident in the predictions. So it's the same delta as in the theory. Uh, and so you can see that, you know, if you're confident enough in the predictions, you're very close to the, you know, learning based tool when it performs well in both of these situations. Uh, and as long as you don't overdo it, you're still doing as well as uh, or nearly as well as, or even better than the uh, you know classical guaranteed policy 
uh, if the predictions are bad. So you're making use of the predictions while still enforcing uh, a guarantee in the case that the predictions are off for whatever reason because of the training. And so this is a really optimistic plot for you know how this stuff works in practice. And, and this, this these plots are done with real workloads, real uh, data system, data center models, and all of that sort of thing. So these are these are fairly uh, you know uh, realistic, practical situations that I'm showing you. Um, oh yeah, I had arrows to emphasize that, but hopefully you got it. Okay, and so you know the this highlights though the importance of setting that parameter. Uh, and so there's an open app algorithmic question, which is, can you adaptively learn that online? And can you adaptively learn to set confidence in the predictions? And this is where, if I had more time, I would uh, switch to my third example and you know introduce the LQR model uh, and talk about robustness and consistency there. Uh, and in that context, we can prove a result uh, of this form where if you take sort of a randomized follow the leader approach uh, and layer it on top of a robustness versus consistency switching algorithm, uh, then you can actually provably learn this in a way that gives you a guaranteed competitive ratio across any sort of confidence level without this need to kind of set the parameter of confidence uh, a priori. Um, uh, but that's, that's I think, the only setting where I know of such a result in this literature right now. So that uh, layering on of the adaptive selection with guarantees is really uh, something that's just emerging as a, as a result that people are going after in this, in this kind of world. Okay, but when we went to uh, online optimization, uh, my goal was to talk to you about memory uh, and this adaptive online switching algorithm with this guarantee that I just showed you the results for uses memory. Uh, and we know that we don't need memory to get robustness guarantees. So the question is, you know, can you get away without memory? And again, we can show a fundamental limit here. So we can show that uh, it's, it's kind of as bad as it could be here. So you cannot even benefit at all in terms of the competitive ratio uh, without using memory. Uh, and so in particular, if you, you know, are looking at a memoryless algorithm and you want any constant robustness guarantee, uh, then the best you can do for consistency is kind of a one over root alpha guarantee. And if you remember, we can get one over root alpha without using advice at all. Uh, and so we, you know, if we want to have any robustness guarantee, there's no consistency guarantee that can do better than our completely online no prediction algorithms uh, without using memory. Uh, and so you really, like, really using memory is a fundamental need of algorithms uh, for robustness and consistency in this online optimization world. Uh, and it would be really interesting to understand this sort of question, this sort of limit in other applications. So I don't know of any results like this outside of the online optimization uh, model yet. Um, okay, so now, of course, yeah, I can't show a result like that and, you know, then say, well, what about you know, making the model a little less general, right? This is for, uh, this doesn't require non-convexity, but, you know, even in the convex case, but what about, you know, something else? So can you do better outside of this? Uh, and, you know, it turns out you can. So uh, in the convex case in one dimension, which may seem simple, but actually there's a, you know, very big literature just on applications and algorithms for the one dimensional case that's still emerging. So this is still an important problem. In that case, you can actually, with a memoryless algorithm that is kind of an adaptive interpolated version of that uh, state of the art algorithm online balanced descent in that setting uh, can get a you know consistency and robustness guarantee you can get a way better guarantee than the exponential form uh, that we had in the general case uh, and you can do it with a memoryless algorithm so you know there is optimism in, in achieving this sort of a guarantee with a very simple black box combinator uh, you know in in simpler settings just not in the general setting uh, for, uh, for online optimization. And here there's still an open question. So our algorithm has this one over delta squared lower bound. Uh, I, it should be one over delta. I'm sure there's an algorithm that can get it to one over delta, but we don't know how to do it. Um, okay, and so with that, I'll start to wrap up. I wanted to make sure to leave time for questions. Um, but you know, the, the idea here is you know, hopefully I've made a case uh, and gotten you a little bit intrigued by this idea of, can we get the benefit of both worlds uh, without delving into the nitty gritty of the, you know, individual AA models and individual guarantees and instead 
taking this kind of uh, K-experts framework and viewing it as a task where we just need to find a way to combine trusted and untrusted experts without paying attention to the details of how those experts are making their predictions. Uh, and so that's, I think, the high-level framework of all the results that I talked about today, and I think it's a really promising framework. Um, and so, you know, the goal of this framework is to, you know, try to take some way of combining them to get consistent and robust algorithms. Uh, and, you know, the results that I've shown you have started, you know, this, this, this idea of understanding the limits of different types of algorithms in this world uh, is really new. Uh, there isn't that kind of uh, general sort of result across many of those uh, applications yet. So I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done. Uh, you know, in the specific cases that I showed you, we can start to understand what the, that there are these fundamental limits between what you can accomplish with memoryless algorithms and switching algorithms and, and more general algorithms. And I think that's really intriguing to understand how general that is across different applications. Um, I think you know this this thing that I hinted at in terms of the quality of experts is a really interesting question because uh, you know in practice it does make sense to try to learn something about the quality of your untrusted expert uh, and adapt to that uh, and so you know go after a better consistency guarantee if you realize that your untrusted expert is pretty good a lot of the time uh, and so be more aggressive in that way and you know there's one approach that we have in one setting that has started to flesh out uh, ideas there but i think there's a lot of important work to be done there in terms of making the these things really perform well in practice um, and then, you know, another thing that I think is a really interesting question in this domain is right now I've treated the untrusted experts as if they could be really, really bad. And as if all they're giving you is a prediction of what you should do. Uh, in many cases, you know, they could give you a prediction of what they're going to do and some confidence in that prediction. Uh, and so from an algorithmic perspective in designing these, you know, black box combinators, how valuable, how much more improvement do you get if there's quantification? You know, if the if what the algorithm is giving you is a little bit more complex, if they're giving you not just their prediction, but some sort of uncertainty quantification about it, that should be very valuable. How much does that let us expand uh, this, you know, region of feasible robustness versus consistency trade-offs? I think that's a really interesting question. Uh, and then, you know, there's also the question of why are we limiting ourselves to one expert of either type? Uh, you could imagine a, an expert that gives you a good competitive ratio, an expert that gives you a safety guarantee, an expert that guarantees stability, uh, and having a bunch of different trusted experts with different guarantees that you want to combine and take advantage of, you know, a neural net approach, a deep net approach, a like different AI approaches, and you want to then combine uh, a, a sort of a, a mixture of these experts and still get a best of both worlds, best of all worlds type of result. Uh, and I think that would be the sort of, you know, the, the, the big question this area is how can you move beyond just two experts to, you know, experts of trusted in different ways and mixing them with untrusted experts. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully uh, that intrigues you. Uh, I'm very happy to follow up with lots of questions around this. Uh, you know, I, I really think this is a promising uh, new area with lots of open questions. Uh, and, you know, there's many applications that I didn't talk about uh, where people are exploring these questions. Uh, and I think, you know, a general view that kind of cuts across problems is just beginning to emerge. Uh, so, you know, I hope many of you are excited to work on it and follow up with me about this. Uh, so here's the papers uh, that summarize the results that I talked about. And thank you. Thank you for your talk, Professor Rubin. Um, right now we can take questions. Um, we have until three, so plenty of time for questions. Um, you can type your questions in the chat or use the raise hand function and we can just unmute and uh, ask your question. Um, just to start us off, I had a sort of big question possibly. I was wondering if there's any connection to your approach on combining like trusted and untrusted advice and and the literature on like bandit problems with expert advice where uh, you see how well an expert is and maybe use their advice or don't use it. Give Definitely, it like I, I wasn't using the K-experts language just uh, superficially. Uh, you can definitely take uh, probabilistic approaches coming from the K-expert literature and use them uh, to try to combine algorithms in this way. The, I'd say the structural difference in making them work is that, you know, in a typical K-experts, there's not a, the experts aren't bringing with them a guarantee. 
So the proofs here, you know, one of your experts is bringing with it a guarantee and you want to keep that guarantee in the combination. Uh, and that means that there's a new sort of analysis and new sort of combinations that you want to be able to carry forward to make it work. Uh, and so that's that's really, I'd say, the sort of mathematical novelty compared to the algorithms in that literature. But but in some cases, those algorithms work in the in the metrical task system work. There's a nice paper where uh, in sort of a randomized version of, of that problem, you can take some algorithms from K experts and port their guarantees over uh, to a, a specific robustness versus consistency question. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, I saw Samia had her hand up. Okay, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, my question, uh, you kind of touched upon it right at the end with the uncertainty estimation part, um, if, whether you can incorporate that. I work a lot with uncertainty estimation for neural networks, and my takeaway has been there's a lot of uncertainty even in that uncertainty estimate. Um, yeah. that they're not very good always, and sometimes the network itself is predicting that uncertainty. I guess, do you have any ideas on what you're looking at in that space to deal with, I guess, the uncertainty in the uncertainty estimate and how you involve it in the decision making? You're one step ahead of me there. I, so I don't have results yet for the you know uncertainty, even if you were certain about your uncertainty. Um, but I, so I think you know, I think you know, in some sense, if you're too uncertain about your uncertainty, then you use this type of results I've presented today, and you just ignore that information. But but if there's actual you know value in the uncertainty quantification, I think it's really interesting to say you know, for example, in a switching algorithm, uh, you know, maybe you're recognizing when that uh, you know your 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 sort of time that you're spending with each algorithm will depend on the certainty it has. And maybe there's enough information to recognize when that certainty you know, information is violated uh, and then give up on the algorithm because it's, it's kind of invalidated its own assumptions about itself. Uh, and so I think, I think there's a lot of interesting algorithmic tasks that uh, the, right, the right kind of API is what is, uh, I think, hard to quantify as a theoretician. Like, what form of certainty guarantees do we want to uh, take in from the, from the black box expert that we're, we're thinking about? Um, but yeah, I, I'd be really interested, but, the, but the, the work you're describing is exactly the type of work that we hope to uh, build on, right? So I'd love to take something that you did that has a certainty, uh, you know, estimation and plug it in and take advantage of that certainty explanation to get a better guarantee. Makes sense. Thank you. Did that wrap? Hey, Adam, good to see you. Um, nice to see you. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, oh, so in the switching algorithm, uh, the algorithm explicitly follows uh, for part the trusted uh, expert and then part untrusted one. Yeah. Um, uh, and potentially you already thought about this carefully, so maybe simple question, but if suppose you did not know who is trusted or who is not trusted, uh, is there sort of a hope for doing something like coding uh, on top of this or this That's a great question. simple counterexample? We have not thought about that at all. Uh, that's a really interesting question. I mean, we're, so we're, we're, we're really driven by the domain, you know, like think, if, you, if you think concretely, you know, you have an algorithm that you can certify stability for, uh, you wanna combine it with some, you know, un completely untrusted AI tool and get a better algorithm out of it. And so in our framing, we, we've always known what is what, uh, and the you know one algorithm is bringing with it the guarantee, and we play with that guarantee uh, in the analysis. So uh, I haven't thought about that at all. It would be very interesting, and maybe it would connect to the previous question of like, you know, can you get some sort of uncertainty quantification uh, during the running, uh, and then use that uh, in the in this kind of black box combinator. How I think I saw your hand next. Uh, hi, Adam. Uh, so can you go back to the slide where you have the, did the experiments on the data center data? Sure. Yeah. Those are brand new. So I, this is the first time I'm showing them to you. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, it seems like uh, on both plots, like this AOS algorithm is somehow doing like in, uh, on, under certain regime does better than both experts by a quite a uh, non-trivial margin. Is there any like explanation or like or insights on how and when that happens? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what you should expect in these out. Like, it was nice to see this. That's what we expected. And this, you know, is an empirical demonstration of it because, you know, you're, you're really at any given point in a switching algorithm, giving up on an algorithm that for whatever region and whatever part of the instance is performing badly because that cost is going to skyrocket in that period and you're going to switch to the other one. And so, you know, in most situations, you're going to be much better than both. It's going to be kind of hard to get a situation where you're really significantly worse than them, uh, unless you're putting all your weight in one side versus the other. So, you know, the fact that adaptively during the you know sequence of time, you're allowing yourself to switch to whatever is working better at that moment, uh, you know, means that in practical situations you should be, you know, really getting the best of both worlds, not just in this like worst case consistency robustness sense, but in the empirical sample path like way too. Okay. So yeah, I was very happy to see this kind of validate my intuition about the real world performance. William, I think you were next. Yeah, so so actually it's basically a question about this slide. So it seems like super important to have these data sets that kind of like continuously vary in different ways from the actual training data. Mm -hmm. How do you think of coming up with data sets in general that sort of effectively vary, vary in ways that are going to be relevant to real life? Yeah, this is this is something we're we're thinking really deeply about in our group actually. So one of our one of our projects that uh, hopefully will uh, you'll hear about in the coming year is uh, to try to build an AIGM like environment for sustainability problems, uh, so that you can have that kind of uh, variation in a you know trusted model driven way uh, for real world problems like sustainable data centers, voltage control, and power systems, etc. Uh, and you know, so I think you have to you have to do a lot of uh, thought in designing uh, such process, and you have to work with you know real world partners in in, in those areas to do it right. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. And, you know, in this case, we have you know some really good industry partners uh, that we we work with on you know designing these uh, simulators and getting data from, uh, so that we're capturing the real phenomena. Thanks. All right, we had a question in the chat from Lucy Lowe. Oh, says for switching algorithms with memory why is there a fundamental limit from untrusted advice without memory why is it achievable without advice sorry i i lost uh, too many trust and untrust but let me read it uh, sure. uh, <laughs> uh for switching algorithms with memory why is the fundamental limit ah so so in this this results uh where i said Basically, that you know this one. Uh, so why why can't you? Why do you really need memory? Um, I guess the the intuition maybe this is too high level, but the intuition here is really that to do better than the worst case, you know, uh, uh, sort of robust, you know, non prediction type algorithm, you have to be willing to follow the untrusted advice. Um, but if you're willing to follow the untrusted advice at one time step without paying attention to whether it fooled you in the past, uh, it can fool you over and over and over again in really bad ways. And so you need to kind of have a memory of how much cost the untrusted advice would have incurred uh, during different phases of the run to know how much to follow it, how much faith to put in it. And without that, you know, it can just give you a really terrible advice and screw you up and then you recover from it. And then it can do the same thing over and over again in an adversarial way uh, and really, you know, destroy your performance here. And so, you know, to avoid that, you're basically having to do what the robust algorithms would do anyway, which means that uh, you're, you know, kind of, you're not able to improve on the bounds that the uh, robust algorithms were giving you in the first place. Uh, but maybe that, that helps a little bit, Lucy. I don't know if you want to uh, ask follow up and ask if it wasn't clear. It's a very good question. Perfect. Thanks. Great. Uh, I think we're running up to the hour, but I uh, so I, I don't know if uh, we should stop there or if there's any last questions. Any last questions? Okay. Well. We're right at almost at three. So um, let's just take this moment to join me in thanking Professor Weirman once again for a great talk.
Um, there are lots of interesting ideas and I'm, it's a great kickoff to the rest of our session.